Disruptors and curious minds, welcome to another episode of Thinking on Paper, where we get to talk to the innovators and the builders thinking about and designing the next version of the world. My name is Jeremy. With me, as always, is Mark. Today, our episode is focused on some really cool stuff. So, so you think about whether you're whether you're building a product, leading a marketing team, selling services, you're always looking to connect with an audience for people to interact with what you're doing, for people to buy something you're selling. And, you know, this audience is is really just a collection of people. People have behaviors and there's actually science and studies of how to design experiences that are rooted in how people behave, which is super interesting. And more so on top of that, you know, how is how is learning in general going to change in the future? And what will technology do to power or hinder these experiences of connecting with an audience and these experiences uh, of learning new things? So that's that's what I'm excited about, Mark. What what, what are your thoughts? <laughs> I think you've summed it up pretty well there. I, I, I'm, I'm like most people, I use AI for the for the novelty for the creative aspect of it because it's fun i enjoy making stupid images i enjoy using it to make short videos of our talks um but i'm really interested to see how my kids are going to use it and we i think that today's talk conversation is really important because we're going to be digging into educational design, using AI to augment our thinking, using AI to, to think clearer, which reminds me of the book club, by the way, in case you were wondering, we have a book club and we're reading clear thinking. So I think this is a links very well with today's show. So Amazing. Um, I'll, yeah, our guest, I'm going to introduce our guest. Why don't you introduce our sponsors first before I uh, introduce Justin? Yes. Yeah, so, uh, so thinking on paper is powered by a wonderful company called Ripple, W R I P P L E. Ripple is marketing's on demand talent platform, basically, a, a collective of over 3,000 vetted solopreneur specialists in their individual discipline. And what's interesting about what Ripple does is they are actually the, the, the people that organize teams with multiple disciplines right so when you're when you're building something complex you have to have different people that are really good at different things but more importantly you got to have a nexus thinker call back to the book club and julio otino the nexus you got to have a nexus thinker to coordinate that amazing talent check them out w-r-i-p-p-l-e mark you're on so welcome to the show i'm uh, gonna uh, apologize in advance for the butchering of your surname justin uh, an experienced learning and behavioral designer who's using AI tools to enhance reasoning and decision making. He's the founder of Jeremy Notion, which is uh, an exploration of behavioral design and the technology. Welcome to the show, Justin. And well, I think the, thank you for having me. <laughs> the best place to start is with the correct pronunciation of your name and perhaps a a bird's eye view of behavioral design. Sure. So my surname is pronounced Hermeses with a H. So um, <laughs> gives a lot of people some difficulty. But uh, yeah, like diving right in, behavioral design is another way of thinking about applied behavioral sciences. So the Behavioral sciences span a lot of different disciplines, things like psychology, sociology, um, neurology, um, behavioral economics, a wide range of different disciplines come together and inform how we think about behavior, how we understand it, and also how we change it. So behavioral design is more of a design discipline that draws on all of that science to help us figure out how do we design things that are better at helping people behave in desirable ways. And what's nice about behavioral design as opposed to other uh, disciplines looking at influencing people is the goal generally is to be ethical, to help people behave in ways that they would choose to behave if they were able to decide that for themselves. And as you know, there are lots of things that you or I might think, you know what, I would love to do that, but we don't exhibit that behavior. So there are all kinds of other barriers that come to play. And 
behavioral design helps with that. I got got a quick question on that. So you mentioned you you were saying uh, getting people to behave in desirable ways. So mm -hmm. let's talk about who in this. The ethical piece of this is fascinating as well, right? right. So <laughs> yeah. so desirable ways as it relates to the person behaving, or desirable ways as it relates to the person, external person trying to get a behavior. So the person. <laughs> so so certainly, it can be used in both ways at least from my perspective and with the people in the behavioral design community that I'm a part of, the focus is really to help people behave in ways that align with their own values and their own, their own goals. So um, for instance, somebody might think it's desirable to quit smoking, but they just struggle to, or somebody might think it's desirable to recycle more, or to save more for retirement, uh, all sorts of behaviors that they themselves think are good for themselves. But, struggle to do for a variety of reasons that so th this isn't about nudging it's not this marketing term of nudging people into buying things by designing the behavior behind that you're more interested in the personal voyage of being a better thinker physical health whatever it might be i think it's across the board certainly nudge theory is a really big part of it um it's not a lot of people confuse behavioral design with nudging Nudging is sometimes used, but not always. It is incredibly useful. So there, there's another really great book to read is Nudge. Um, and in that book, the author introduces the notion of liberal paternalism. It's this idea that you're trying to help people make better decisions and choices and take better actions for themselves, but without forcing them, without removing their freedom and autonomy to do something different. So. Yes, again, it can be used for marketing purposes to get people to buy stuff, but at the same time, it can also be used in ways that are favorable for the person. So the topic of this conversation is the intersection between behavioral design and education. And so in that particular intersection, the focus is, well, how do we use all of the tools from behavioral science? How do we use the broader set of tools to help with educational outcomes, however we define education and those desirable outcomes. Is it is it fair to say that the behavioral design used in the right way, used in the ethical way, would enable somebody uh, to achieve their desired behavior? Absolutely. Makes sense. So, yeah. So, I mean, think of it from the perspective of a student. They know they need to study. It's something that they desire. They want to learn. They want to grow. But you know, when it comes down to sitting down and studying, the motivation is maybe not there. Or there are a million other distractions vying for their attention. So in that regard, behavioral science and the insights, behavioral insights can be incredibly valuable. So you mentioned school. Uh, I'm not going to spend too much time on this soapbox. Mark, Mark might have to rein me in. I, I'm going to mute you. Like, well, no, because I'll probably you'll set me got, off, and then we'll just waste all the time. I got to at least. About I got to at least set it out. I'll there, be right? the third so part school, of that training. Actually. Yeah, public <laughs> school. Public school hasn't changed largely in you know hundreds of years since the 1800s. Right? It was designed for a specific purpose. Look at the history. You know, read for yourself. It was designed for a specific purpose. And that purpose no longer serves society, right? So what now I'm not saying they're great teachers, great teachers out there, great people doing great things in education, but what what does what could behavior design do to improve the learning experience for for students? Big question. Big question, Jeremy. <laughs> okay, so I just want to take a bit of a step back and just talk about learning design as well and some of the assumptions. So most of my career, I've worked in adult education, not K to 12, although lately I've been doing a lot more projects that span the full spectrum. But largely, in my experience, the reason we build a learning and development program is because ultimately we want people to do things differently, to behave differently, to be able to accomplish things that they might not currently be able to do. But when you take only a learning design perspective, you tend to limit your diagnoses of the problem to things that relate to ignorance or a lack of skill. So 
almost every problem becomes almost like a knowledge or a skill problem. And if you only look at that, you ignore other possible reasons or barriers preventing the desired outcome. So by extending that view with behavioral design, you can also look at things like broader capabilities, opportunities in the environment, motivation, um, social dynamics, um, the design and structure of the world around them. All of those things form part of your initial diagnosis of what is getting in the way of the person, or in this case, the student, from achieving those results. So in many ways, it's not always just about designing a learning experience. It's actually often about creating opportunities or designing environments or interaction opportunities for people to achieve their, their outcomes. So let's talk about behavior or not, not behavior. Let's talk about barriers. You reference barriers a lot. And, mm -hmm. and this is, this I've been, I've been studying this for, for quite a long time. I'm not a researcher or, or that sort of thing. I'm just a curious dude. Um, so when someone hears an opinion brain, the brain loves shortcuts, right? The brain loves, yeah. loves shortcuts, right? So if I really trust Mark and Mark tells me something and I'm going to use Mark as my shortcut, Mark's belief now becomes my belief when it's my belief my ego is involved in protecting that belief and it's very difficult for you even though your opinion might be more valid or more updated <laughs> how do we get past that barrier because that i mean that's a bit, really big question because that goes politics that goes society <laughs> that goes all the stuff but like would that would that be a barrier and how, what could we do to 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 address that it, it certainly is uh, again, coming back to the work of um, uh, Daniel Kahneman and Amos Tversky and a bunch of other researchers that identified a variety of different biases, um, you know, we do use heuristics. We do, do have biases like um, confirmation bias. So by being able to label those consistent and predictable phenomena, we can identify tactics that would work better. So for instance, recognizing that somebody might have confirmation bias, or they might <laughs> double down on their beliefs when you challenge it, it, it's useful then to start thinking about how framing effects influence how people receive messages. So you might not necessarily frame something as being in opposition to an existing belief, but rather something that is compatible with an existing belief. So having those concepts and having that vocabulary helps you to think about strategies or tactics that would be better suited to helping somebody change their mind. And, and often you create opportunities where somebody might experience something, not realizing necessarily that it is challenging their belief so that they get that kind of direct experience. This is all quite abstract at the moment, but um, I think that I, does that answer your question? No, ab absolutely. I mean, it's not an easy, it's not an easy thing to unpack. And if it were an easy solution, someone would have built yeah. a algorithm that jars our brain to do something differently. Um, well, I like that word jar, jars your brain. Mm. Um, you just mentioned confirmation bias. I, I'm a big sucker for recency bias mm. and, um, goes back to the book club Farnham Street and you said having the vocabulary and kind of Farnham Street made me aware of these mental models of how many there are and how many we are susceptible to and just the fact of knowing them makes you aware that they are in your in your mind in your ear influencing your decisions influencing your behavior and we're going to get into the tools that we're going to use to to jar us into into remember is, is, is that is is that part of this that kind of jarring our brains to become aware of the the biases and the limitations that we're working under so one thing that i think is uh quite commonly understand understood is that even being aware of your own biases doesn't necessarily inoculate you against them no uh, it does sometimes give you a vocabulary. It helps you to slow down, identify possible traps, but we're still heir to those same errors because of 
the natural limitations of our minds. So instead of an attempt to make people, so again, coming back to my point earlier, if you take a kind of a learning design perspective only, you see everything as an education piece. People need to become aware. It's about solving the problem through understanding. And that's totally legitimate for like tons of problems that's useful. But something like bias, and in the course of my career, I've brought, built multiple debiasing programs as well from a learning perspective. And I can honestly say that they generally don't work. What is useful from a behavioral design perspective, and this comes back to another book you you reviewed in your book club not too long ago is the design of everyday things which i cannot recommend more highly is how we design the environments in which people um, find themselves is actually even more important so typically as a behavioral designer because convincing somebody is actually a really hard thing to do but changing their environment or changing the structure in some ways uh, can often help bypass that, that limitation. So one of the questions that I would ask when diagnosing is what are certain things in somebody's environment that make, say, certain biases more likely, and how can we restructure that environment in some way to naturally have a debiasing effect? So... It's a slightly different perspective. And so that's why I think that this intersection between experience design and behavioral design is super important. Sometimes the solution isn't about changing something for the human, but sometimes changing something that in the conditions that the human beings find themselves in, something in their context. So I think that that's, that's quite important to, to make that distinction. Um, so to give you a, a very good example, and I don't want to go into too much depth in the book, but what I do love about the book is uh, the author, Don Norman, spends an enormous amount of time on doors. And this is really relevant yes. for education. <laughs> and his argument is that you should never have to have a workshop or trading session in order to learn how to use a door. The design of the door should be such that when you see it, it's obvious what behaviors or actions are possible. You shouldn't have to have a sign that says push or pull. You know, if you just see a regular plate, you can push it. If you see a handle that you you naturally reach out and you, you can fumble in the dark and you will just pull down and the door will open. And the reason that doors are such an important example is that how much in the world could be designed in such a way that people could naturally and comfortably interact with it without first having to have like four hours of works, workshop sessions with a, with an expert or a door, door workshop. There's some very funny anecdotes in that book about when doors go, when doors go wrong. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. It's, so, it's, it's, yeah. It, in the way, and again, I don't want to dive in too much on, on the, on that book. You can, you can listen to all seven chapters in, in the book club. The, the interesting piece about that, I think is it goes back to enablement. We talked about enablement in the very beginning of this conversation, but mm -hmm. enablement of uh, the conceptual models in people's heads of how to react with something. And it's got to be this, this intuitive nature and going back to the debiasing, you know, I, I, you, if you go, Hey, Jeremy, it's time to debias. I'm going to be like, no, dude, I'm not. No. <laughs> but if I, if I come to the re realization myself and say, yeah, I probably need to debias that or whatever, it's got to come from an internal kind of aspect. Right. Hmm. So I think that th that comes back down to the science behind it. It's under what circumstances do we have what is called reactance? You know, we hear something and we want to push against it or where we believe something and we want to reject all other contradictory ideas. That doesn't happen to us all the time. They are conditions under which we're open. So there are certain, so for instance, people are more open and receptive under, um, in environments where there's perceived psychological safety. So again, that comes back to how do you design a psychologically safe system? Not just an environment needn't just be the physical environment, can also be the, the, the system or the processes you find yourself in. And so 
a lot of it is saying, okay, well, how do we how do we identify what those triggers are and what those cues are? So sometimes design isn't about what you're going to add in, but what you need to take away. So it's subtractive in nature. Um, so yeah, I think that there is certainly a lot to to look at from that perspective. But I think I just want to come back to a point because this is going to be relevant later. There's a lot of science around you know, making learning effective, making learning more engaging. So for instance, how do you chunk content to reduce, you know, um, extraneous cognitive load? What is the optimal spacing between repetition to um, counteract forgetting? How do you leverage forgetting to actually enhance learning experience? These are all things you think about when designing a learning experience. But if you take a concept from the book like the design of everyday things, which is very important, this notion of affordance, you're like, how do I design products or activities in such a way that people can naturally see what needs to happen without first having to read, you know, three chapters of a book? So how do you balance those things? How do you build a holistic intervention that actually helps to change what people do but without being limited in your perspective yep wonderful wow okay um just trying to ask jeremy if we could do like a, a thought experiment with one one behavior that you want to change but so we have this overview of behavioral design artificial intelligence mm. is coming into this domain where are we? What is it capable of doing? How are you using it? Okay. Yeah. What should we be, how should we be thinking about AI to augment behavioral design? And then we'll get into education with that. <laughs> sure. So <laughs> the, the area that I've been focusing on pretty much for most of my career and a lot more quite recently is this idea of AI reasoning support. So it's to say, what we've learned from behavioral science is that human beings are cognitively limited. We don't necessarily make good decisions under the best of circumstances, let alone when we're tired or we're stressed or we're under social pressure. So we have all of these things that make it hard for us to necessarily make the best decisions. With AI, AI can help to supplement that reasoning, particularly with the latest advances in models, you'll see a lot of the uh, selling points for the, the most powerful models like GPT-4 or Claude 3 is its reasoning capability. And they look at how it reasons through things like mathematical problems or how it reasons through medical diagnoses. Many of those cases are kind of closed ended reasoning tasks where you can actually say there's a right answer if you reason well enough. A lot of what I'm interested in are like open-ended reasoning tasks. So let's say we're having a debate about ethics. There are better and worse ways to reason about it, but there isn't necessarily a right answer. So a lot of the a lot of my work revolves around how do we identify good ways to reason when we don't know what the right answer is? And in a world where we can delegate a lot of well understood tasks to AI a lot of time is going to be spent on things where there aren't correct answers, where there are different perspectives, different ways to discuss or dissect a uh, situation. So just to give you an example of where I've used AI and reasoning support is actually from a learning and behavioral design perspective. So I've worked with lots of junior and upcoming learning and behavioral designers and the one thing I found that they typically have problem with right at the beginning is this process of diagnosis. And we've already looked at when you're looking at why somebody's not doing something, why is somebody not recycling? Why are they not conserving water? Why are they not engaging with people in a healthy social way? You know, whenever you look at any one of those, the diagnosis is incredibly important. And you can look at 100, 150 different factors that could be related. And when you're trying to design some sort of a solution to that, 
what is very, very difficult is to do that comprehensive diagnosis. You know, do you look at cultural factors? Do you look at motivational factors? Do you look at who the messenger is? Because that plays a really, really big role. Do you look at how something's framed? Do you look at what it's anchored to? Lots of things you can really consider when trying to design a solution. And human minds are quite limited. So it's very hard to run through all of that systematically. So where AI has been very, very useful, and this is something that I've, I've actually built, is it will take a problem that you've identified and it will automatically run through lots of different possible barriers from all of those different perspectives. So whereas a human being might be able to look at, say, 10 or 20 in the course of 10 minutes, with AI, it can kind of run through that divergent thinking in parallel and cover 120, 150 factors in under a minute. So once you kind of go and look at that, you can say, oh, you know what, I, I didn't think of that. I hadn't considered that maybe who the messenger is is actually the problem. I thought I need to, you know, create a course and have somebody sign up to, you know, Udemy, um, when actually the problem was the messenger. So that that is one one way where it can really, really help designers, particularly in that divergent thinking step where you can cover a lot more ground in a lot less time. And then you can go back and use that to scaffold your thinking. I love that. Can we can we do it? Can we do a little thought experiment real quick? Sure. And this can be as high level as as we need to be. I might want to play around with this with this tool that you built. So I I coach lacrosse. Um, you know, sport okay. and um I've got you know high school guys, youth guys, and to 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 do anything uh, successfully with the sport, you have to throw and catch. You have to learn how to throw and catch, right? And, you know, one of the things I would look to diagnose is like, why, how could I motivate these guys to learn that? Or why are they not learning throwing and catching? And, you know, what, how would we diagnose that just from a high level? I'd be curious. So obviously we can start to unpack it in a number of different ways. First, you want to see what can you exclude? Does anybody have any kind of visual or physical reason? That they might not be able to throw and catch that might actually be the reason and there's no amount of other intervention that's going to change it there is also an intrinsic or extrinsic motivational possibility like what's in it for them why what do i get out of catching this ball why should i care you know um sometimes it's about goals or planning has that person set any kind of clear goal or actionable actionable steps to helping them do it more from the learning experience design perspective is the notion of deliberate practice. Am I doing something and then getting timely, relevant feedback and then iteratively correcting without overtraining? Um, do I have people <laughs> who throw straight? <laughs> like, I can't catch a ball if people aren't throwing it at me, right? Like, sometimes that's the opportunity that's missing is that, you know, I can't learn to catch if I have no ball. That's a resource issue. Amazing. Amazing. Like where you go with this stuff is amazing. So this, so if I were to put that in this tool, this tool that you built, it would start putting out some of the things that you yourself were just kind of riffing on. Is that the idea of this tool? Yeah. Is it open and, access? Can, and, can uh, listeners access this tool? Like so how does it work? So currently it's just sort of a prototype that I, uh, I've created for myself. Um, it generally works. I just haven't put it out into the world yet. It's just one of my side product projects that I've been able to talk about, but it illustrates what I mean by a reasoning support tool. You take a complex bit of reasoning, and so th this is quite useful to point out as well, that the idea is not to replace human judgment, but to help compensate for where our cognitive capabilities often fall short. And the great thing about AI is it doesn't just, it's not just good with being able to do divergent thinking and come up with lots of ideas. It can also help with an evaluation step. So if you give it a set of criteria to look for, a framework to use, to compare things, it can actually help with the analysis. So once I've, say, generated 150 different possible ideas, I need a convergent thinking step. I need a way to, sh to narrow that down to, say, the top 10 that might be most relevant. And again, AI can help with that, that side of things as well. 
Jeremy, this is Nexus thinking. Like the, aug, I, I think of this as augmented creativity because you're, we're using it to divergent thinking. Essentially, is just letting your brain go crazy and come up with all these ideas which may or may not be useful further down the line. And yeah, okay, we can come up with 10, 20 in 10 minutes and you use these models to just augment that creativity, to, to bring ideas. And I, I like the idea of you speaking earlier about the messenger. And so my experience is very limited and I, uh, to a, a select few sources of input during my life. And AI has many, many, many more of those. So it has this data set where it can take creativity, which one of the things we always say is that human creativity is what separates us from this the machines. And, and in fact, no, <laughs> <laughs> it's an augment. It's, it, it augments our creativity. So I, I agree with you completely. I'm going to say something a bit contentious now. I don't yes. think that there is any Ta-da. cognitive ability that AI cannot match, at least in terms of its output. So you can have a philosophical discussion about whether it's actually critical or whether it's actually create, uh, creative. I think that that's a semantic issue. But if you ask, can it generate 50 good ideas? Yes, it can. Can it generate some sequence of ideas that make logical sense that are feasible that have not existed in the history of the world? Yes, it can. It doesn't matter whether you call that creativity or not. So even when it comes to exhibiting theory of mind, so the other one that people say is it's it can't exhibit empathy. So it doesn't have, it might not have feelings, but it can model other people's thinking states and then be quite accurate in its prediction. So if I say, well, this person is just, we've, I've just had this exchange with a person, here's a transcript. What do you think that person's motivations are and what do you think their emotional states are? AI is pretty accurate in what it brings back. So even from that perspective, <laughs> I think that, uh, and this, this is a, another contentious thing I, I had, a conversation with somebody at a call center at my bank and I was just wishing I wish this were AI I would have had a more satisfying and sensitive in quotes uh, interaction um, so that that's interesting so what's contentious is that I think that there's nothing that we can currently do that it can't match but I don't think that that applies to everything that we will be able to do, cognitively speaking. So I think that with the introduction of AI, certain new kinds of cognitive capabilities become possible that have not been possible thus far. So we can think of AI as a scaffold. Um, you know, I, ha I do this exercise <laughs> with a, a little kid in my life. I use Dolly and they just, they're three and they just say, tell me a picture of a octopus riding a fire truck. And 30 seconds later, there's the picture. So this idea that you can go from a vague notion to something that's manifested that you can then iterate on as a series of successive scaffolds to take your thinking further, that same exercise would probably have taken like weeks and you probably would have given up after like an hour or two anyway. So you would just never have had the opportunity to go further. Similarly, if I have to sit and do thorough systematic barrier analysis by hand, I might spend weeks doing that. But AI hey, can spit something out and I can look at it, ingest it, build on it, evaluate it. It makes all sorts of new higher processes possible. So will AI be able to beat what I, what we as human beings might be able to do if we've had a lifetime of this. To put it another way, never in the history of the world has explanations been as accessible as they are now. If I don't know something, I can pick up AI and say, explain it like I'm five. And within 10 minutes, I have a grasp, at least some initial traction. But if I remember my experiences in education, 
if I had something I didn't understand, I'd be in a classroom with 30 other kids, I'd put up my hand, the teacher would be stressed, frustrated, maybe give me a 30 second answer that doesn't help me understand. And then I'm too embarrassed to ask again. And I never get that explanation or understanding. So the thought experiment is, for me, at least from this perspective, is if I had never been denied an accessible explanation during the course of my life, what will I be able to do with my mind? And then would AI be able to do that? That's a big one. So, so it's like AI beats human. I know beats not the right word. AI beats human, but human plus AI will always beat AI in terms of cognitive p- power. Always uh, is a tough word. Yeah. Yeah. I, 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 yeah. I, I know. Yeah. So I, would, I retract. I retract. I'm going to use AI. There's an AI bot telling me, Mark, you got to think clearer here. Retract that <laughs> word. So I retract. So I think that. the way that I think about it is that AI will enable a bro- broader range. I always say that it expands our ontologies in the sense that I can engage with more things, more ideas, more things that possibly exist than I would be able to without it. And so there is a future, and I I think my personal experience is at least anecdotal (laughs) evidence right now, is I'm able to think and experience things, unique things, that no other entity in the universe would think or experience while I'm partnering with technology, not just AI, any kind of technology, right? And so I might not be better or worse than AI. I mean, that might not be the right thing to judge, but I will always have the potential for a perspective that nothing else in the universe has. I will always have the potential for an experience that nothing in the the universe might be able to experience. And that that is perhaps an infinite well of discovery and of inspiration and of creativity. And much of that AI, no matter how powerful, or no matter how much better than me in objective ways it might be, that's something that it may never ever come up with. Because AI is not, it's not, it's not you. Yeah, right, right. Yeah. yeah. No, that's really, really interesting pers- perspective there. I want to, I want to do two quick things because I want to make sure we dive into this. Um, this idea of uh, of technology enhanced cognition and cyber skills versus 20th century skills because i that i think that could be a cool way to wrap this up i do want to pop a question up that we got uh from pame um a little bit earlier what what resources would you recommend for learning more about learning and behavior design sure um so certainly um when it comes to behavioral design generally uh the design of everyday things is definitely one. I will put that way up on the top. Go to the book club. <laughs> the book club, Pame. Yeah. Or, absolutely. Um, but also, there are some really, really great newsletters if you're just looking to dip your foot in. So Habit Weekly is a really big one. Um, a lot of people in the behavioral design community. So if you're just looking for recent news, um, that's great. There are some really, really interesting models and things you can kind of look at. So. Uh, If you're just looking for a popular introduction to, say, behavioral design, um, Predictably Rational is definitely a classic, Nudge by Cass Sunstein. Also, they will introduce you to initial notions. Uh, Also, something by like Daniel Kahneman, Thinking Fast and Slow, all really, really great books. What about about Cialdini? Yeah, so definitely Cialdini. Those... um, principles of persuasion are incredibly valuable. And the same things do apply in behavioral design, like the way that we respond to things like scarcity, to social proof. All of those things are actually also concepts that are are largely used in behavioral design. Uh, Learning experience design, obviously, they are, it has a very, very long history. Um, But, I think probably if I have to just recommend somebody right off the top of my head is uh, Seymour Papert. He's coming up quite a lot lately in these circles. Um, definitely worth reading. And then um, we, we've been talking about extending ourselves with technology. Uh, definitely look at the extended mind hypothesis and the work uh, done by Andy Clark and David Chalmers. They have a really cool book called Natural Born Cyborgs and supersizing the mind, both of which I would highly recommend. 
cool title i like that title man those are those are book club book club hits right there we got to do those but (laughs) maybe natural natural born sideboards yeah so let's talk about that let's 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 um we've got we got i don't know about five minutes left i want let's let's see if we can um stoke the fires a little bit on 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 what technology enhanced cognition is what the extended mind hypothesis is and how that relates to your work and, and what you're doing cool so the extended mind hypothesis is basically this idea that our minds are not contained within our skulls, that we are constantly co-opting the world to expand our cognitive abilities. And even simple things like being able to write something down on a piece of paper or on a screen, you don't have to hold that in working memory. You're outsourcing it to the world. And at the point at which you need to remember or retrieve it, you just read it back. So even something like that can be seen as us extending our minds. Even if you look at an abacus, you know, you're storing numbers in a visual format in the world that helps you read it back. So all these sorts of things, and I, I don't want to go into too much detail because you'll you'll read all of that as well. The idea is basically that we use the world around us to help us think, that our minds actually extend into the world. And that's what uh, Andy Clark means when he talks about cyborg. He, he's not talking about things bolted onto you or implanted in your brain. It's just in a very real sense, your brain is so plastic and so adaptable that it starts to build a a model of you that includes your tools and the world around you. So that's, that's typically what is meant by a cyborg. Now, what's interesting is that when we look at something like AI that has incredibly vast capabilities and that is becoming incredibly easy and intuitive to use, most people don't need a very need any training to get started with Jet GPT because it's something as simple as having a com- conversation. So in the language of Donald Norman, the, the interface and the chat model affords conversation, which is something that you, many human beings are really just comfortable with. So it's a really nice way to interact with it. As time goes by and as we start to incorporate AI more into the tasks that we do, we gain a fluency and the AI starts to become invisible. We're just kind of, I always think of it like Iron Man. Iron Man isn't Tony Stark, it's not the exoskeleton suit and it's not Jarvis. Iron Man is all three together. So I always think that when it comes to education and thinking about human performance, we need to think about a new functional unit. We need to shift away from saying the human, the bare human is the functional unit but actually the collective, the human being plus their technology, plus their AI, um, you know, assistance and tools, that's the new functional unit. And as we gain fluency, the barriers between those things start to um, disappear. And it becomes harder to tell where my thinking ends and AI starts because it's this constant feedback loop where I might do some evaluation, outsource a little bit to AI, it comes back with something, I pick up some of the reasoning. It's just this constant like free flow of delegation. And it's kind of like being married for 20 years. (laughs) (laughs) You're you're no longer an individual, you are this entity. with (laughs) you've completely you've wiped my mind now, I've forgotten what I was going to say. augment me so jeremy go i've lost my mind no i've got a question i'll get back to no it. this is this is super fascinating the the idea of of the augmented you know uh, people get scared when they start thinking about cyborgs and we're gonna have like bolt-on technology and be all you know you know not really human i mean we we already have we already have bolt-on technology i mean some of us some of us are able to separate ourselves from it a lot of other people aren't it's just not fully fully connected but i think it's i think it's tech plus humans i mean gary kasparov said the same thing when um he he played chess against the computer right then they started talking about all right well then humans plus this tech is is going to make it work and as with everything it's balanced right Mm. Balances everything. Ha, ha, aware of time, I know what I was going to say. Now I was going to ask you a question um, about. Is that it, this is put this all together. It's teaching us how to think, not what to think. My kids are eight and five. Mm. 
how should I as a parent be thinking about, should I be using AI already to augment their thinking? Should I be introducing them to it? Should I be doing thought experiments? How or what should I be doing to sow the seeds now that in 10 years okay. they are ahead of the game? So let me, I, I'm conscious of time, but I'll try to say five different things as quickly as I can. Take your time. It's okay. Oh, okay, cool. So there's quite a popular um, perspective in learning theory called uh, cognitive apprenticeship. And this goes back to how people used to learn, a master-apprentice kind of relationship. It's recognizing that a lot of what is valuable to teach is not something you can articulate in words. It's something that you demonstrate because the world is a messy place. You can't always flip to the back of a textbook to say, okay, here's the answer to the question. You know, you have to figure out, well, you know, what applies. And so the thing about AI is that even if we're using AI with our tasks, we don't stop learning. It's still modeling good thinking for us. It's still modeling productive cu communication. So assuming that you're using AI tools that have good guardrails for someone so young, uh, if it's a teenager, it's possibly less of an issue, but certainly something that's, that's safe, it can serve that same role where it's modeling good thinking. It's also reducing the friction and the radical reduction of friction that AI introduces is probably one of its biggest benefits to education. There's so much that we don't learn just because it's so damn hard to get, the, get something that is easy enough to understand. So I think that if I have to recommend one thing for your kids now is just explain it like I'm five. Like if, you, you, if you're only using like one millionth of the capacity of AI for anything, this is what you should be doing with your kids. It's saying, okay, let's help them help themselves. Because that's one thing that AI does is it promotes autonomous learning in a way that nothing else has. And so with the world that's changing, we can't predict what your kids are going to need to know. But if yeah. we've prepared them to use the technology to help themselves, then I think that that's really um, a massive step in the right direction. Now, at the beginning, we mentioned that I do make a distinction between 21st century skills and cyborg skills. And cyborg in the sense that the philosophers mean it, not, you know, um, you know, sci -fi. Not Skynet. Exactly. So 21st century skills, when we talk about them, we think about things like communication, critical thinking, empathy, creativity. And as we've said before, as we are now, these are things that AI can match or exceed. Cyborg skills, however, is a shift in that perspective and says, what skills do we need to fluently partner with AI? So how are we becoming a seamless new unit in terms of extending ourselves in a variety of ways? And then what new skills become possible once we've done that? So that's what I mean by cyborg skills is when we start thinking about what do we need to focus on teaching people to, to thrive in the future, it is, okay, how are you going to first go from zero, not being able to use this technology, to having it seamlessly extending you? And then how do you discover entirely new skills that enable you to accomplish things that we've not, not yet imagined? Justin Chemises. Uh, we appreciate your time and Show energy. Off. This, uh, <laughs> this is, um, I tell you what, this is like, so thinking on paper is the intersection of culture and emerging tech. I don't know if we've ever had an episode as landed in the middle of culture and emerging tech as today. And it's so important, this grounding of new technology in existing models of how the world operates. So Justin, this was this was fantastic. Mark's going to do a, a brilliant write up. We'll put a bunch of links, send us some stuff if you want to send it on. Uh, Mark. And I won't use AI. And but I, I love what you say there, Jamie, because thinking on paper is that epicenter of 
of culture and technology. And I was thinking of a few of a couple of other episodes we've done. The one with Elizabeth Strickler, where we spoke about VR in education, and obviously the one about AI agents we, we did with Charlie Northrup. And starting to imagine these three, I mean, there's others, but those particular VR, AI, and agents working together to to really augment me and us and to augment the human species. We really are a technological species going into the future with these technologies, augmenting how we learn, how we behave, how we shop and work and play and all of those things. And it's this is a really powerful, important, mind-bending um, addition to that. So, yeah, thank we you. Yeah, we... Yeah. And we, we talked about cognitive load earlier. Right. And like, you know, what humans, the, the things that I run into is I, I encourage people to find their, their superpowers, right. In, in some of the stuff that I teach and in the, in the programs that I work on and, and having those unlocked for somebody and then trying to use technology to augment the rest, to save cognitive load for the stuff that you love and the stuff that you're good at and the stuff that you want to lean into. I think that's going to be the really interesting yeah. balance. So that's, that's my takeaway. Um, Quick shout out again, um, speaking of enabling things, uh, W-R-I-P-P-L-E, great partners of Thinking on Paper. Thank you guys so much for supporting the show. Um, they are marketing's on-demand talent pl platform. If you want, uh, you got a project, got something going on at your organization that, you're that you don't necessarily want to bring in FTEs for, lean on these guys. They're amazing. They can organize interdisciplinary experts. Mark and I are actually in there as well if you want to work with us. So um with that, um, Mark, give him a shout out about the book club and we will get everyone on their days. Yeah, join the book club. A lot of the books we've spoken about today are available to read with us on YouTube, on Spotify. Um, like, comment, share, all of that stuff. Um, and we will see you next week. Ah, no, we are. Oh, we forgot the question, Jeremy. We forgot. What question? For the next guest, Justin. Justin, leave us a, a, yeah, leave us a question for the next guest and we'll carry it over. Right, so I gave this some thought uh, ahead of time, but my question for the next guest is, how do you think generative AI will affect Web3, but more specifically, how could it affect building communities and the creation of shared value? Awesome there question. You have and it. We'll, I will post Justin's answer to last week's question on some social media platforms. So you have a bit more time <laughs> to think about it. <laughs> thinking on paper.xyz check us out spotify wherever you listen to your podcasts on youtube and uh definitely join us next time stay curious be disruptive keep thinking on paper take it easy guys right <laughs>